This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a two o'clock block. I'm so happy to be here. Um, we have a special show, as we did last week. It's about public participation in a polarized era. Continued. Step two. <laughs> we have Keith Matson, who is one of the organizers of this program and a participant. Um, and we have my special special guest, um, Colin Moore. He is with the Political Science Department in the School of School, School of Social Policy, Public Policy, Public Center. Policy at UH Manoa. Yes, yes. And he is a participant in the program. Are you also an organizer? Yes. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, then it's all level it's playing all together. Field here. Yeah. Yeah. So, will somebody please tell me what the program is about? Where, when, how, and who? Okay. Well, it's a uh, a conference on public uh, participation in a polarized era, and it's uh, basically de designed to take stock of what is working um, in, well in public policy or uh, public participation, and what is not and to probe what are better ways, maybe, better solutions, uh, better approaches, better methods for getting the valuable types of uh, public consultation you need, whether it's for planning, whether it's for permitting, whether it's for agency rulemaking, or some other hot issue where, in a democracy, we need that consultation. Mm. December 1st. December 1st at the East-West Center. Uh, that will be the, uh, the day one. And then there's a day two part, which is really focused for practitioners. That will be at the UH Law School. And uh, it will um, showcase a little bit more of uh, what some professionals are doing innovatively in, uh, in the areas of public participation, particularly for specific kinds of things like controversial issues, mm -hmm. Native Hawaiian communities, designing unique processes. So <clears throat> can you give us the lay of the land on what kinds of panels? Um, we have uh, a few different panels uh, that we'll talk about. Well, uh, two in the morning that I think are particularly interesting. One will be uh, looking at what's on the, uh, the books, the legal requirements for public participation right now for, let's say, uh, an environmental impact statement or for uh, agency rulemaking or for something like that. And uh, then we're going to have three perspectives, uh, one from the environmental uh, community, uh, one from the business community, and one from government, about how will those legal requirements, those, those things that everybody's doing on a regular basis for consultation, how well are they working? Where are they falling apart? Where, in their own personal experience, have they seen them either succeed or fail? And that's going to kind of get us to a point of looking at different ways of doing public participation that are maybe a little bit more unique. So we're going to have, uh, following that, a, uh, a panel on case studies, five different people talking about, in their profession, uh, examples of different types of public participation processes that they've run. And some have been uh, um, successful, some have been kind of middle of the road, and some have been, uh, to be quite honest, uh, uh, failures. And your role? I'm going to be moderating that first panel I talked about, the one where we're looking at um, the existing uh, requirements and uh, uh, the, um, the, the sort of experience from three different uh, perspectives on that. Okay. So <clears throat> will I get the press coming down to this, Colin Moore, Professor Colin Moore? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that if you're coming down to this conference, you're prob probably already depressed about the state of public participation. Um, you know, and that's a discouraging thing because, you know, as, as a lot of folks will recall, the reason we have all these requirements, I mean, it dates back to this period where people thought that, it, you know, sunshine was the solution, that more public participation would lead to better outcomes and people would be more involved in the government. We'd get away from the smoke-filled rooms and bring the community in. The problem is most of the people who do do this work most of the time. I mean, who have run these um, uh, these opportunities for the public to participate? I think are pretty discouraged by the results, and the public who does come are pretty discouraged. And I think anyone who's who been part of one of these would feel discouraged as well. I mean, usually you get a, a small number of very intensely interested people who are often there to, um, you know, to, uh, to, to push their own ideological agenda. Um, often the same people seem to turn up to meeting after meeting after meeting. You almost need, don't even need to hold them because you know what everyone's going to say before they open their mouth. And nobody's listening. And nobody's Anyone listening. Anyone else. No. <laughs> there's no, um, it, it often just turns into a shouting match, which yeah. you know, is often what my students say when I tell them to go to one of these and see how 
it works. They just yeah. come back and they say, it was just a bunch of yelling. I mean, it, <laughs> they never want to go again, which is a pretty discouraging thing. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I, I think you and I share the thought about, you know, the, um, the quality of our democracy these days. Maybe we all do. Um, so if, um, if the world is more complex and the government is more complex because the world is more complex, uh, the people have to keep up their participation because, after all, the people are the government. The government is the people. There is a social compact. There's a, a requirement of exchange between the people and the government. But somewhere along the line, and it's only been revealed, in my view, in the, in the Trump administration, uh, as you know, so starkly, is that people haven't kept up. They don't, you know, EIS. Oh, that's so complicated. Right. We don't want to be involved in that. Make it go away. It just gets in the way anyway. Uh, transparency. That's too much information. Right. And uh, the only people who really speak to transparency, the ones in those silos who won't listen to anyone else. I mean, it's like, it's like, have have we lost it? in terms of connecting up the government and the people. Um, is, is, that, is that involved in this discussion somewhere? Oh, I think absolutely. I think that's one of the, the key things we'll discuss, uh, how, to, how to do that in a more effective way. Um, because right now it's not working. I mean, even if you, even if we don't talk about you know, some of the results that we've seen from the, the Trump administration, uh, the fact that we don't even seem to share the same reality anymore. I mean, would, right. you can accuse anyone of making up their own facts or uh, just dismiss any any report that doesn't confirm what you already believe is fake news. It's it's pretty difficult to have a conversation about about much of anything. Um, but even before that, I mean, we're, we saw I think this this system begin to begin to break down. And part of it too is from the folks in government. I mean, because they sort of talk about this. Even the word stakeholder engagement. I mean, really. Sounds, can sound a bit condescending, that we're going to go and show you our plans, you people are going to say whatever you say, and we're going to go back and do whatever, whatever we, we want to do in, at the end. And I think a more effective approach tends to be you have to engage these people from, from the very earliest stage. Um, but that's a difficult thing to do, and it's becoming, I think, increasingly difficult in a more polarized world. Well, if I want to, you know, if, assuming we could agree on the facts and uh, an approach, um, you know, this is the reverse of latency. I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, how long would it take to get everyone in this country of, what, 300 million plus people um, together to understand that we have to work together on this and we can't be in silos and we have to listen and, and we all have to believe in certain fundamental ways of doing government business? How long would it take to train everyone yet again to make them take courses in history and government, the kinds of courses we had to take in school to make them understand the relationship and the obligation of a citizen? I mean, 20 years, 30 years, do we have that much time? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're asking a very impossible question to, to answer right there. Um, but I think you're, you're getting at something that, that is really important, and that is like, there seems to be quite a, a breakdown in the ability to uh, grapple with uh, issues from a, um, a, a sort of a whole cloth sense. Um, I think we're seeing situations where people are uh, jumping into their bubble chambers uh, or their echo chambers, if you will, um, just uh, listening to news that fits the political narrative that they have decided is correct and reinforcing that constantly. And um, because so many, so there's so much news in such a, um, uh, a, a sort of specialized way, uh, some of it real, some of it not, um, you can just feed that beast 24-7 uh, if you want to. And I think we're seeing a situation right now where there's a breakdown in civics, uh, where people may have the last meaningful interaction with people who don't agree with them in high school. And then after that, they're off into, you know, um, a very, very closeted sort of orbit. So yeah. it's that that's that's a pretty dark, you know. Yeah, well, I mean what's darker but, is the future. I mean, if this yeah. continues and if people, you know, do these kinds of silo things mm -hmm. and bubble things, mm -hmm. how long can the country last when the country is really um, it's a it's a it's a collective of people who are all who all believe in something. <laughs> How long can the country last that way? <laughs> it, it, it's very troubling. I mean, there's um, there's a, a well-known um, 
uh, legal professor named Cass Sunstein at Harvard University who studied some of this and um, he really talks about the damaging effects to democracy of what he calls the daily me, which is what Facebook and Netflix offer. I mean, the algorithms try to give you more of what you want. Oh, you like to watch this show? We'll give you more of it. Some you like this information? Yeah. We'll yeah. give you more of it. Yeah. And that works. Um, you know, that that fits the market model because you know businesses want to deliver to you, Jay Fidel, the kind of things you want to consume. It doesn't work as a model for democracy because the only way for democracy to work is for you to be to feel uncomfortable at times, to be confronted by ideas you find objectionable. Think of the greater good. Yeah, for everyone. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> because it, because you, you're forced to do that. It's harder to dismiss people or ideas um, if you've actually confronted them or you know someone who shares that idea. Um, if you can retreat into your echo chamber, you don't have to do that anymore. And so it's much easier to dismiss people as as enemies or fit them into some sort of you know insane conspiracy theory. I mean, you don't have to treat them as uh, fellow citizens. And so breaking out of that is is going to be very tough. And we know from all the social science studies that when somebody believes something, I mean, when they really believe it, and you say, okay, you don't believe in climate change here. Can I show you some data that, that demonstrates that might be true? Or you believe that Barack Obama wasn't born in Hawaii? I'll show you some evidence that shows that's not true. The problem with that is, as all the psychological studies show, is when you do that, people cling to their previous belief yep. even more. Yep. And the only way... You must be trying to trick me. Yes, you must be trying to trick me, or you're a liar. Um, <laughs> because I know this to be true. Yeah, that, that, I've heard this before. It's, it's, it's uh, something called reactants, I guess it's called. Oh, yeah. Interesting, you, interesting. you hear facts, and even if you, like, this happens in the vaccine uh, debates. Uh, oh, where parents who choose not to vaccinate their kids uh, and then are shown some facts about uh, vaccines that um, refute what their beliefs are. And they actually say, yeah, this is kind of true, but I'm still not going to. So it hardens them. But, you know, um, these are really big questions yeah. that we're talking about. And my question to you is, how can you wrap around such a huge, you know, fundamental discussion? I mean, a discussion that affects our lives and our future, everything around us, I mean, and our children and our progeny and every, how can we do this in a day and a half? Well, I, I think uh, in particular, uh, to try to put a little bit of focus on this particular, pro uh, Please. on this conference. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on nationally, internationally. But, you know, in our, in our own state and community, we, we still have to live and work together, share infrastructure together, and make decisions collectively on uh, where we're going to build, where we're not going to build. Well, is Hawaii be better concerned. suited? Does Hawaii have certain natural cultural, you know, community characteristics that make us better likely, more qualified to deal with these problems? I think in some cases, yes. Um, I think it's a fair statement to say that uh, most people would agree Hawaii is a more civil um, society. Uh, you can see it in uh, driving habits. Uh, when people go to the mainland, it's a little different. Um, how they, people interact in retail. Um, it just seems like it's a little bit more uh, So if we focus this discussion here in the program on December 1st on dealing with um, the sort of the lesser polarization, I'm, hope, I'm, hope, I'm hope, being hopeful about this, mm -hmm. the lesser polarization we experience in Hawaii as opposed to the country. Uh, then maybe we, we can wrap around a solution. Is that is that the hope here? That is the hope. I mean, we don't have as far to go as some communities on the mainland, but but we do have our own set of challenges, and I'll give you a, an empirical example of that. So my public policy center is starting a survey research center, and we just have our first sample poll. And one of the questions we asked was, how how often do you participate in a public meeting? And you know, the vast majority of people say, not at all. I mean, that's our major problem here is just um, no civic engagement. But when you keep asking, OK, two meetings, three meetings, four meetings, the number keeps going, going down, 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 until you ask eight or more, and then all of a sudden it jumps up. There's about 10% <laughs> the population. activists. Exactly. You show up to everything. <laughs> and that is the other challenge for public participation, is you can't just listen to the activists. The point of this is to listen to the community. But we only are listening to the activists, and we know those are the people who are the least likely to be interested in compromise. Yeah. You talk about public meetings as if that was, there was something special about a public meeting. I mean, I can get information on it's a 6 o'clock news. I can get information off my 140 characters. Right. I can get information from whatever flies at me in the email and all right. that. Why do I need a public meeting? Why is a public meeting mano y mano important? And I, I think that's what you're talking about, eh? Yeah, and uh, I think uh, you, you really have to get at what type of public meeting it is. But 
ideally, it's not just a chance to voice stuff. It's a chance to interact with the proponents of a project or an issue. Ask them very uh, honest questions and, and hopefully get honest answers. That's the best kind of public meeting. Yeah, is that something about something about being close physically to the next guy. For That's example, it. we have uh, Norman Rockwell's painting of the Four Freedoms, which hangs in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, uh, not too far from Harvard, <laughs> not too far from Yale, yeah. for that matter. Um, which is uh, which is a fellow in a, a working man's shirt, a blue collar worker, and he's standing in a town hall meeting and all the people are looking at him and listening. It's right outside. Mm -hmm. And um, and they are they are touching each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, if not personally, then they're close enough to actually react to each other physically. Yeah. And I, I suspect that's what you're talking about. That's a, a, a public meeting where people actually react to each other. And it's one on one, but it's more than one on one. It's one on many, many on one. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is a guaranteed to come to some kind of psychic conclusion somehow, no? <laughs> That's the hope. I mean, there's lots of ways to structure public participation. Um, I mean, obviously you can do it online, but I tend to think that's actually not as successful. I mean, the gold standard are actual human interactions. I mean, that's true um, for a number of different issues. I mean, it's the way you build trust. Um, it's, it's harder to dismiss someone as a crazy conspiracy theorist. If you know them, if you yeah. help them get their coffee it's or something, all trust. of a sudden they're, they're a human. And, and, um, and then you, you might listen to what they say. You know, hey, this guy, he's not so bad. Maybe, yeah. maybe he has a point. We've got to get back to that. It's something in New England. It's something in the formation <laughs> of the, of the, of the uh, democracy. So let me ask you some questions that are specific here. Um, what are the problems that we have identified in our community that get in the way and that you're going to be discussing? Well, um, this will be uh, more about the, the types of process that goes on with uh, different uh, for public participation. So some of the um, some of the issues that will come up are like you know uh, planning projects, uh, complete streets in Honolulu. Uh, the Kauai GMO pesticide um, uh, debate. Well, points of contention. Yeah, those will be the the examples. But you know what we really want to get at is like, how was the public involved or not involved? Uh, what was the outcome? Um, was it uh, a good process, um, an effective process, or not? Um, can there be better ways to do it? And you know, to me, I think the most interesting thing about uh, this conference is there's first of all there's no set way to do public participation. Um, it really should be uh, tailored for the specific issue, audience, and community. And How can you resist having an inclination, Keith? Don't you have to go in there with an inclination? Uh, Don't you carry your inclinations with you somehow? Oh, you mean biases? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Biases. Yeah. Well, uh, I think everybody has biases, but okay. the important thing is... You don't is show them. No, you, you, I think the best thing you do is disclose them. Ah, disclose them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, do it honestly. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, as yeah. long as they're not like malevolent And that biases. goes for everybody, right? Including the people at, at, in this conference. Ideally, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, we're not going to ask people to, <laughs> no, no, to, no. to uh, display their biases necessarily. Um, but, <laughs> but surely there'll be people who show up to this and think the public participation is garbage. Yeah. <laughs> right. But if you're also if you're getting it like uh, what are the issues with public participation or the problems? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with timing. So many uh, participation yeah. processes happen late, and they are um, seen as sort of after the fact. Yeah, um, like rail. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's Neil it Milner, on, your, your yeah. predecessor, is Neil yeah. Milner. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what, what, what he said was, uh, you guys, um, the government, decided on rail before the public weighed in. So should you be surprised now that there's a lot of controversy <laughs> about rail? You, start, you started you know, putting spikes down um, before the public had actually agreed. And I think that's true. That's what happened. Yeah. Well, another thing that's, um, I think, an issue with uh, public participation is um, it takes a lot of work to do it well. Yeah. And if you're, uh, let's say, building a project, um, you're focused on the engineering, the budget, you know, the, um, the environmental work. Um, but to, to do an effective public uh, participation process all the way along, it takes a lot of work. Well, and it takes a lot of work to alleviate polarization, because polarization is an impacted condition. Yeah. And it runs deep, especially if you've been doing it since you got out of high school, right? Yeah. Yeah. And haven't been having honest, legitimate conversations. So how do you... How do you 
bust the polarization bubble. Are you hoping to do that? At this, at this project? Well, I think we're hoping to, to have some strategies and we'd like to leave with some concrete recommendations. But I mean, I think, um, you know, one thing that works, seems to work, is starting this process much earlier. And, you know, Jay, you're involved in, you know, I think one of the more successful and long standing groups that, that does public participation or community consultation, and that's the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And I think one way that works is you're not consulting about a specific one issue, should we do X or Y? I mean, it is generally a forum about um, future energy policy for the state that brings together stakeholders. It's a standing group. Um, and so you can, you, you not only do you have representation from a bunch of different groups, but you can kind of begin to see where there might be potential problems early on. And, and I mean, it's a collaborative process. People don't feel like they're being consulted at the end. Um, it's an ongoing, yeah. um, it's an ongoing meeting, and that I mean, for polarization, this is one thing that does work: is that if people are much less willing to dismiss facts or suggestions as fake news, um, if it comes from someone they already trust, if it comes from someone they see as an ideological ally, um, and so if I know that I trust this person because I work with them, and they say, no, you know, I've been on this, been a part of this process, we've been doing a lot of work on it, and you know, this is a reasonable plan. I, I think you should give it a second look. That that changes the way people perceive well, I know it. Now you're getting into leadership. Yeah. I mean, leadership is so important, and and we haven't we haven't been blessed with a lot of really good leaders, mm -hmm. at least in m my my time anyway. I mean, you guys could be. I mean, a leader has to be open-minded. He has to disclose his biases and, 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 and be able to talk about them. Uh, but he has to also foment following. And people have to be ready to follow a person who is a good leader. That's another social compact. Um, isn't that part of this discussion? Um, to, to deal with the question of finding good leaders, elevating good leaders, and following good leaders? Uh, that's, a, that's a big issue right there. Um, but you know, I think kind of uh, to tie it to both this conference and uh, what, what Peter Adler was saying on the interview you did the other day is um, in, in public participation, government should be looking um, for consent to lead. So you know, not consensus on the topic because mm -hmm. you know, quite frankly, it's almost impossible to get a consent of people behind anything. But, and if you seek that, you won't get a result. At right, all. you won't. You you'd be frustrated forever. But if you uh, are looking for consent to lead after you've had a very good, thorough discussion of the issue with a broad cross-section, then I think you've got that um, ability to lead more effectively. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be an exciting conference. I, I mean, I'm going to be. OK, now, <clears throat> this next, the next question is, how have your own experiences with public participation? Because you guys wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be in the program. You wouldn't do what you're doing now without having had plenty of experience in, in the public engagement. So what, you know, what, what do you bring to the table there in terms of that experience and how will you visit it? How will you roll it out in this, in this program? Um, my uh, career has got a, a lot of um, agency work. So I've uh, been to a gazillion and one public meetings on different issues and you know, I like call them the same. The type where the you show the, the regulars have shown up, uh, and uh, you know what they're going to say before they say it. But I'm going to focus on just two uh, different ones that are local and fairly recent. Um, when I was with, with the university, uh, I was a project manager for the regional biosafety lab project that ultimately never got built. I remember that. You remember I remember that. I was there when you were speaking. Right. It was down in Japson one day. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So anyway, uh, make a long story short, uh, this was a lab that was going to do uh, research on infectious diseases that are airborne, like tuberculosis, like uh, dengue fever. Uh, and um, it was uh, state of the art, uh, National Institutes of Health funded, and um, we were going to build it out in uh, Kapolei. But um, as you can imagine, building a laboratory that does work on infectious diseases is a very, very tough sell. Uh, Nobody to, wants to be near the no, antigens. In 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 I've classic planning terms, science it's called fiction a, movies and all that. Yeah. It's called a Lulu, which is a locally unaccepted, unacceptable land use. A Lulu. <laughs> so um, you know, it was very very difficult to do the public outreach on this, but um, it was also a matter that people were misinterpreting um, or misunderstanding the nature of how people actually contract infectious diseases. They don't. 
contract them walking yeah. past the lab. I remember there were a lot of activists who would never, ever have agreed that a regional biosafety lab would yeah. be appropriate in Hawaii. They yeah. had yeah. so many reasons, and they never thought that actually it would be a good thing because it would help us deal with infectious diseases. Yeah. I found that remarkable. They rejected that out of hand. But you know, one thing you said makes me remember my own experience. I, I was in Washington Place being sworn in as a, a director of the High Tech Development Corporation. This is in the early days, Linda Lingle's administration. And, and uh, Steve Levinson, the judge mm -hmm. at the time, was there and he said, this is gonna change your life. Really? Why? You know, I'm not gonna change my But it did, because all of a sudden I was on the inside of government. Yeah. And when you go inside, like you're in, in the university, same thing. Your experience factor, your point of view changes so dramatically. Mm -hmm. And I learned, I was, it was like taking a, may I say a PhD, I don't want to deprecate the term PhD here, but it was like taking a PhD <laughs> yeah. in government. All of a sudden I knew what went on in those, in those back halls. And Sounds so, like being a, a colonoscopy program. <laughs> <laughs> There's a remarkable coincidence there. <laughs> what about you, Colin? Well, so I, I, I've, I've, I've always been either a consultant or academic in these processes. I've never had to run um, a real public consultation process myself, but I've, I've seen so many of them and seen how they seem to, to fail. And I've always had a different, difficult time squaring that with my belief in you know, good government and more government transparency and um, and trying to, to think about more creative ways to do this well because I think it's something that everyone who studies politics thinks they, they want to believe in and when you see it in practice it's it's pretty ugly business and to some extent you, you begin to you know feel nostalgic for the days of the you know, days of the you know smoke filled room where people could just hammer out a compromise and move on and maybe we'd be all be better for it so there's a lot of scholarly literature that's worked on that's worked on this but i mean partly we do have need to have more discussions i mean i think we 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 really don't have the answer going into this and we hope that bringing people who have a lot of different experiences and different stages of the process um, we can actually come to some concrete recommendations i i believe you guys and i feel the same maybe you go into a meeting like this you don't know exactly what's going to happen mm -hmm. you don't know what the result is going to be and it's it's uh, it's not just there's going to be some activists on this point or on that point no it's going to be something that, that germinates within the group and all people being reasonable and they're going to come up with stuff that we cannot actually anticipate Mm -hmm. How about that? Mm -hmm. This is a pretty valuable conference, I think. I think so, too. I mean, and that's why I mean, we're having it in person. Like we said before, I mean, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. a way to really exchange these ideas. We could, we could have done this, you know, as for comments on the Internet or, or written the piece and, and seen what comments we got. But I think this, this process of bringing everyone together, we actually might get some original insights. Now this whole thing like the forum, it is an electricity and yeah. in, in having an even playing field, electricity and listening to whatever anyone says. Okay, let's... What expectations do you have? What types of outcomes? Don't commit yourself on this. <laughs> would you like to see? <laughs> well, um, you know, this uh, gets to uh, what uh, the other interviews with Peter and uh, Greg uh, said. We want to have a short list of initiatives that could be uh, done by different types of people to improve public participation. And so we don't know exactly what those will be. We have a couple of you know in initial ideas, but. Um, we want people to spend enough time thinking about where things have worked and where they haven't to be able to, to uh, intelligently and effectively say, you know, maybe we need to do more of this in this situation. And maybe we need to try this that has never been tried before. Maybe it's been tried in a different community. Yeah. Um, for example, Oregon does some amazing things with public participation. They're enlightened there. Yeah. Most of the state, not all of the state. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and they're willing to take some risks in Oregon. I mean, that's part of the problem here in Hawaii is that yeah, yeah, there is this say. deep, not political conservatism, but almost, you know, social conservatism make a wave. where we're, we've done it this way forever. It works okay. So why are you trying to mess with everything? I mean, we, we need to take more risks here. Yeah. Well, I think this is going to be very interesting. And the, and the question I put to you guys, which I put to Peter Adler the last time and Greg Chun, is, is that, um, so you have this meeting as so many meetings, and everybody says at the end, gee, that was so great, that was so great. And then everybody goes home. They go home. <laughs> That's it. How do you perpetuate this thought process? How do you move it forward? How do you, you know, breathe it into the atmosphere so people remember it? 
I mean, one of the points is uh, you're going to make proceedings, you're going to make a book, and you're going to publish. But tell me how you feel that that will work. Um, well, I think uh, one of the things is that we expect, expect most of the audience, or a good part of them, are going to be people who run public meetings themselves, and or decision makers that um, you know have responsibility of overseeing uh, the public participation process. And so, if they come away with, you know, I'm going to try this approach next time in this particular. Project. That's that's a win right there. Um, yeah. The proceedings themselves uh, should be able to um, uh, identify the initiatives that uh, could or should be looked at, um, and whether or not we as uh, individual volunteers take that up, or possibly uh, as people in the uh, county or state government take that up, we don't know yet. But you know, those are two ways that I think it can quote unquote live on. Yeah. You know, when you went to school in political science, took your degrees and all that, <clears throat> you never thought that your education would be so relevant and so critical in our time. <laughs> I mean, you well, must wake up every morning thanking God that that's what you studied. <laughs> Well, it is a very interesting time to be a political scientist, but I have to say that this has also been a crisis for the discipline because we have a difficult time explaining polarization at this level, people's support for Donald Trump, um, you know, how you operate a democracy when everyone lives in their own echo chambers, and I think we're, we're struggling to catch up. Yeah. After all, political science is no more than, I would say, Mm, Large-scale psychology. Yeah, <laughs> it's a discipline that's barely a hundred years old. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, <clears throat> this is going to be a great conference. <clears throat> I'll be there for sure. I want to participate too. Okay. I'm so glad you guys are putting it together, participating. I think it behooves all of us to throw in our lot on this kind of discussion. And the good news is that at this conference, my right, check me on this. At this con conference, polarization is not permitted. Oh that's yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Come Colin. with an open mind. Thank you, Colin. Check your weapons Thank you, Keith Madsen. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Great discussion. So looking forward to December 1st. Great. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. <laughs>